Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that that's very true. You know, our brain is just so incredibly fascinating because I, it will like encode memories in a way that we just do not even understand, which is why so many people have what we call anniversary reactions. So like a year from when the pandemic started, a lot of people may have found themselves maybe more, you know, increased anxiety or feeling more restless or feeling more agitated. And that's because our body holds on to these memories and encodes them in our bodies in ways that we are just not able to like consciously recall. And so somatic therapy, so things like yoga or things like body work where you are focusing on your breathing or, you know, looking at how you're holding tension in different places in your body can be really helpful for those things that words will not help you to access. And so, you know, when we're talking about getting help for mental health concerns, it doesn't just look like therapy, right? Like therapy can look a lot of different ways and talk therapy may be one way that you do that, but there are different body kinds of therapies that people can do. People do different kinds of energy work and yoga and all of these different kinds of things. So healing can really look very, very different from person to person. And it really may take you trying a couple of different things until you find the thing that is a good fit for you. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this edition of On One with Angela Rye. I am so, so elated to have someone who I've heard about so often. Um, I've seen her on air on Breakfast Club. Um, talk to her, talk about her with my good brother Lenard um, from Breakfast Club, and have heard wonderful things about her podcast, which is um, helping Black women focus on therapy. Um, it's called Therapy for Black Girls. Dr. Joy Hardin Bradford is a licensed psychologist, speaker, author, media personality, and the host of this podcast we just talked about. She went to Xavier University, so I have to ask her if she knows my good sister friend. She's also an AKA, which my sister friend is one, and she is the resident psychologist for O, oh, the Oprah magazine. She has all of the accolades. You've seen her everywhere, as you should, and today she is gracing us with her presence. Hi, Dr. Joy. Hello. Such a pleasure to connect with you. Oh, I'm so, I'm so thrilled. Um, we know that this month is very, very special for mental health awareness. I know you have got to be very busy, but um, especially in the midst of a pandemic, how important is it for us to focus on our mental health? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think it's important all the time, but I definitely think with the pandemic, we have seen a greater need for us to be paying attention to our mental health. You know, there's just been so much anxiety, so much in uncertainty. All of our schedules have changed. Sleep is all out of whack. Um, you know, so I do think it is critical for us to be paying attention to how we're taking care of ourselves right now. What made you focus on black women in therapy? Um, I know so often we talk about the stigma surrounding mental health and mental health awareness in the black community. I know that I, in particular, um, will say this all the time, I'm gonna show you my chain, but I have a Harriet Tubman necklace on and I keep this as a reminder for how much she went through and no matter what obstacle comes that comes my way I'm like I can do this she had to go back 19 times to get 300 people and so I'm often thinking about um you know how much they had to endure and I'm always like what I'm carrying is nothing compared to that I saw you talk about how we should stop doing that talk about why and why they, mm -hmm. the focus on black women in therapy I'm glad you asked that question because I was going to gently push back on that kind of narrative, right? Because I think that that kind of strength narrative, this, I can push through anything, you know, my ancestors have had to go through far worse. Like, I think it can be helpful in terms of us developing what we call resilience, right? Which is our ability to bounce back after difficult situations. But I think the trouble with that is sometimes we don't know when to stop, right? So if, if it, if all of your life is a struggle, if all you're doing is, you know, kind of pushing past, then you really are not setting good boundaries for yourself and so you end up with just a whole host of concerns you know so you see physical health concerns as well as mental health
health concerns, you know, the high levels of stress, um, you know, heart disease, blood pressure rising, like all of those kinds of things come from us being chronically stressed. And so when we are saying, you know, like, I got to keep fighting, I got to keep fighting. I think we need to think about how we can do that within limits. Like, yes, you can keep going, but at what point are you going to stop yourself so that you are refueling so that you can kind of stay engaged in the fight? That is, um, it's so powerful. And I, I, I'm interested in the balance between standing on such strong shoulders and tapping into our resilience so that we can overcome when things come our way and also recognizing when we need to be like, help, you know, it's team too much right now. So I, and I'm not saying, you know, I, I gotta believe that Harriet had some foot soldiers with her to help her all of those times. So it's not about, um, necessarily standing on our own, but I do, definitely deal with like they had it way tougher i can get through this mm -hmm. that kind of um mentality uh you talk a lot about um the importance of pop culture um in, in the the mental health space and kind of making these connections is that to normalize therapy what is what has been your reason for ensuring um that you have kind of these pop culture tie-ins and one second dr joy there's um i don't know if that is it that door that's open maybe Sorry, it was like the lawn, or you probably can't even hear it, but it's, it was distracting me a little bit. And now I can't remember what I was saying. Talking about the pop culture tie-in. Oh, yeah. So when you, when you um, figure out ways to kind of finesse pop culture into certain analogies around um, the importance of therapy, why is that so important to you? Is that to kind of remove the stigma? Mm hmm. Yeah, it definitely is related to removing the stigma. You know, I know that not everybody will go to a therapist's office or meet with them virtually. Right. But a lot of us are watching different kinds of shows and movies and things um, where we can relate to some of these mental health concepts. You know, I think sometimes the perception is that mental health is only something we pay attention to in times of a crisis. Right. But the truth is that we all have mental health that we can take care of. And so using uh, analogies and examples from pop culture, I think really help people to see what mental health looks like in our everyday lives. You know, so if we can look at um, how Olivia Pope is, you know, not doing a good, good job of setting boundaries, or if we can look at the relationship between Molly and Issa on Insecure, you know, it can help us to have some really important conversations in our own lives. And I think that that's really helpful. You know, therapy, I think, can be helpful for a lot of people, but everybody's not going to go. And so if there's a way that I can share something on the podcast or on Instagram, or whatever that helps people to make healthier decisions in the interest of prioritizing their mental health, then that's what I think it's useful for. So speaking of pop culture, on this lovely app that I overuse, Instagram, uh, <laughs> you have on here, um, there's a, a quote graphic that you put up. I don't know if it was your quote or if it was um, your, your guest uh, from your podcast, but it says, this whole ride or die thing is dangerous and problematic. It is very often women who end up never choosing themselves. We kind of mm -hmm. touched on that a little bit already with, you know, uh, maybe uh, overcompensation as a uh, masked as resilience, right? Um, but but why is that so important for us to get? I love saying I'm ride or die. Like that's, my, I'm like, well, you know how I am, I'm ride or die. So talk mm -hmm. about why we should be careful of, of using that, that, that theme that, that I'm saying to apply to ourselves. Mm hmm. Yeah. You know, I think so much of what we have been taught, especially as black women about who we are in relationships is sacrificial. Right. So it is somebody else's needs and somebody else's wants always coming over our own. And of course, there are compromises in relationships. You know, you don't know, want to be selfish all the time in a relationship. But I think so much of what we are um, taught and socialized in is that we are always to be self-sacrificing. And so when you are doing that, then who is taking care of your needs and your wants? You know, I think sometimes we get to the point where we don't even identify having our own needs and wants anymore because we're so focused on the other person. And so I think that it is fine, of course, to be loyal in relationships, but it should not come at the expense all the time of you and your self-esteem and your self-worth. How often do you see that come up as um, a problem or as a challenge or, you know, a red flag for whether it's for your clients or it's something that you're hearing from your girlfriends? How often do you see that come up? 
Mm -hmm. I don't see very many clients anymore, so it doesn't come up like in client work, but I definitely see it a lot just in conversations with the Therapy for Black Girls community. You know, different television shows and things will show you examples of that. And so I think it comes up pretty often. I mean, the whole ride or die um, thing that people say, like that's something people are still saying very often, you know? And so I think it is a prevalent kind of idea, um, especially with younger women, I see. So Dr. Joy, you gotten so busy that you're not seeing clients anymore. Is that what's happening? Or do you did you always yeah. prefer like I want to make sure that I'm exposing people to this idea of psychology and psychotherapy and that is my mission more than one-on-one -on -one um consultation what is what is no, it what absolutely not i think if you would have had this conversation with me 10 years ago all i really wanted to do was have like a great private practice seeing clients like that had been my dream right and so um but you know before therapy for black girls was my full-time job i was the director of the counseling center at clark atlanta university and so i was you know doing counseling work with students there but had a small private practice on the side um and then therapy for black girls took off and i couldn't manage all of the things at the same time and so I still really love doing therapy so I always feel like I want to be doing some of it but the podcast and the directory and my speaking have just taken up far more of my time I love to hear it and I love to see it you know I think that that is um, it's a remarkable testament um, to who you are and um, you know your ability to to demonstrate to all of us to the world how important this particular service is and I hope that you are proud of yourself because now you know as we're sitting in this month that awareness you know that you've made a bunch of people aware who've also made a bunch of people aware there was something I was reading earlier about you know again about the stigma in the black community around therapy and how white people will say I'm going to see my therapist but I know a lot more black people now who have been starting to say that over the last few years. I think that that speaks volumes about the work that you do, volumes about the work that Lenard is doing now with the Mental Wealth Alliance. So I just want to commend you all for, for doing that and taking one for the team. And I hope that um, in the long run, it, it gives back to you all that you've given to all of us. Oh yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for that. I am incredibly proud of the work, um, but I'm more proud of all the conversations that all of you are having, right? Because you're very right. Like I think years ago, we would hear white people say a lot like, okay, I got to see my therapist at noon on Thursdays, right? But now so many more black people are saying that. And every time somebody who has a platform or, you know, has followers um, says that, it makes it okay for somebody else who's paying attention to maybe make that call or to send that email. And so it is really important, I think, for us to continue having these conversations about going to therapy, but also about all of the other things that we can be doing to take care of our mental health. Mm -hmm. well, let me ask you um, this around COVID in particular. Um, COVID has uh, significantly shifted, you know, our, our lived experience, whether, you know, it's parents homeschooling their kids um, kids and ability to go out and play and be with their friends and socialize in what we would deem normal ways, um, the way that we grocery shop, um, the way that we see our parents or loved ones, all of that has changed. I just saw my parents for the first time um, this past week since October. And the only reason why I saw them in October is because my aunt passed away. So when you think about what COVID is bringing up for people, whether they got COVID and were hospitalized, they had a loved one who passed from COVID, or it was just being in time out for a year. Can you talk a little bit about um, trauma that comes from pandemic, the pandemic experience? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so much has been upended for us. And I think this year has, has in some ways I felt, I feel like has just been relentless, right? It feels like it has been stressor after stressor after stressor, um, you know, so you're right. Like the ways that we shop for groceries or, you know, see what I see our friends or ability for kids to go out, like all of that has been very different. And so I think it has one exposed just how many systems were broken. I think a lot of us knew that, but I don't know that we all knew the extent to which so much of our life was unsustainable at the rate that we were going 
long before. And so I think people have been able to be reflective, uh, but also really angry, right? Really angry that the systems that I think people thought would protect them and be in place for them were not there in the times that we needed them most. And I think especially in the black community, you know, we're talking about the pandemic on top of all of the racial injustice that we have continued to see, even in a pandemic, right? It's like, can we just have a minute? And we couldn't, you know? And so I think that the stress that comes with just trying to survive and trying to keep your family safe, both from the pandemic and from senseless murders, I think can really be a lot. And so I think people are likely finding themselves incredibly burned out right now. Um, you know, if anybody is not feeling burned out or close to it, uh, you should be incredibly proud of yourself because I think most of us are just feeling like really, really tapped out especially as we are seeing now, you know, the CDC is coming out with like new guidelines around, like you don't have to wear masks anymore, but people are still feeling like very much, no, I'm keeping my mask on because I don't trust y'all, right? And you know, so that anxiety I think is, is coming from a very real place. And so I think as we continue to kind of move throughout this year, it will be a re-entry right? Kind of like a, okay, how do I do this again? You know, like social situations may be really awkward and people may still feel very anxious about doing certain things and you are well within your right. I think when we have been through an experience that was so uncertain and there is just no blueprint for how to go through a pandemic, it is okay to kind of take your time and do what feels comfortable, comfortable for you as you figure out like how to navigate through the world again. You know, and Dr. Dre, you brought up racial injustice. Um, and, you know, we had a really, really tough um, summer, really from Memorial Day weekend on um, last year with George Floyd and when we found out about Ahmaud Arbery and when we found out about Breonna Taylor. Um, so there's another form of trauma on top of the pandemic related trauma. It's this racial injustice, racism based trauma. Also, the Capitol Hill um, terrorist attack is what I'm calling that in Jan on January 6th. How do you encourage people now no longer seeing patients, but best practices <laughs> for people who um, both follow, uh, you know, your your um, your movement around therapy for black women, but also um, all of us for all black people? What do you how do you encourage us to process through this trauma um, that we're still experiencing even before we can get healed again? We're re-traumatized. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, that that has just been kind of continuing throughout this year. Um, so I, I typically tell people to be very careful with what kinds of news you're consuming. So, you know, I think for a lot of people, they feel like they have to watch some of these videos of people being murdered because we want to, like, give credence to this person's life. Like this was an actual person. This is not a movie. This is not made up. But really, you can be uh, experiencing what we call vicarious trauma by watching those videos and it stays with you and you are traumatized as if you were there on the scene. And so I typically tell people, you can give reverence to what happened without um, watching the videos over and over again, because that does tend to stay with you for a very long time. So being very careful to not like have autoplay set on your Instagram or your Twitter feeds so that you don't accidentally stumble onto something. And then knowing when to take breaks. You know, I think so many of us have felt like we are just continuing to fight for our rights and, you know, just to kind of be humanized in this country, but you cannot do that full steam all the time. And so that's why I think community is really important so that there is a group of us who are doing it and then other people can kind of sit back you know so really relying on your community and then making sure that you are talking with other people about how you're feeling you know I know a lot of people have talked about you know being really afraid to drive because they're afraid of being pulled over you know and that is a very warranted fear especially given what we know about this country right and so just letting other people know how you're feeling you know those kinds of things get bigger when we hide it from ourselves because shame then enters the picture right but when you are um, able Able to talk about it, then it releases some of that pressure and you're able to get some support from your community. I um, was thinking about all I've been learning around um, trauma in the body, and I'd love to hear your perspective on, um, you know, when people go to counseling or go to see their therapist, that's a form of dealing with um, what you're carrying mentally. But what's your perspective on how we carry trauma in the body? I've been learning a lot about somatic therapy, and it's fascinating to me because there are all of these experiences we have where, you know, we get nervous, so we get cotton mouth, or it's hard to swallow, or somebody says something that's heart-wrenching and your heart starts beating or it feels like something dropped to the, you know, to your toes. 
What is your perspective on that and how it is, um, it can be integrated with seeing a, a therapist for what's happening mentally? Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, that that's very true. You know, our brain is just so incredibly fascinating because I, it will like encode memories in a way that we just do not even understand, which is why so many people have what we call anniversary reactions. So like a year from when the pandemic started, a lot of people may have found themselves maybe more you know increased anxiety or feeling more restless or feeling more agitated and that's because our body holds on to these memories and encodes them in our bodies in ways that we are just not able to like consciously recall and so somatic therapy so things like yoga or things like body work where you are focusing on your breathing or you know looking at how you're holding tension in different places in your body can be really helpful for those things that words will not help you to access and so you know when we're talking about getting help for mental health concerns it doesn't just look like therapy right like therapy can look a lot of different ways and talk therapy may be one way that you do that but there are different body kinds of therapies that people can do people do different kinds of energy work and yoga and all of these different kinds of things so healing can really look very very different from person to person and it really may take you trying a couple of different things until you find the thing that is a good fit for you I um I love that that you said we can, you know, all find something that is the right fit for you in addition to um traditional therapy, I'll say. Um traditional therapy, traditional talk therapy. What are other forms that you've tried or that are like this is my second favorite? You know, I haven't really tried anything other than talk therapy because I feel like I am a very verbal person. And so I think talk therapy is like a good place for me to kind of that's where I feel comfortable. Um, but I also do a lot of journaling, um, which I would also suggest for people, you know, just kind of writing out your thoughts. And if you are somebody who journals across time, it's really cool to kind of look back at like past journals to see if there are connections. Right. So if every year in April you're writing about a certain thing, there's a way to kind of explore like, OK, okay, well, what happened here? And like, how might I be able to learn from these patterns that I've shared in my journal? So that's something that I really enjoy. Yeah, I just learned about um, uh, this concept of free flow um, writing, mm -hmm. which is, you know, this, you know, write for 10 minutes. My friend Chris told me about this, write for 10 minutes and then like burn it. So you get all this stuff out the way and it really has, I do it in my devotional time in the morning. It's been good for the last several days because I'm like, oh, I don't realize how much stuff is just kind of piled up and it blocks, you know, where you sit in your authenticity or where you sit in your best or higher self or where you sit in your most godlikeness, you know, like it's so it's like, wow, it's a lot of stuff that is packed into our memories and we can be, you know, filtering that stuff through all day long and people are like, what's wrong? Too, right you carry <laughs> all that other stuff so um i can definitely appreciate that i want to try some other things so i'll let you know how they go yeah and you know angela i think related to that what you're really talking about is just having quiet time right so in that free-flowing writing exercise what you're doing is really just allowing yourself to be quiet so that you can engage with your innermost thoughts and i think that a lot of us just don't do that for a variety of reasons right a lot of us are afraid to be quiet because sometimes we're afraid of what's going to come up <laughs> Right. I was so afraid to do that. Like, I was like, yo. And then it's like, thank God for the fire, because if people knew what was in my head. And I literally, I was I was talking to my best friend because we've been doing this um, devotional time together so we could just be accountable for 20 minutes every morning. And I was telling her, I was like, girl, this stuff looks so manic. Like, it, it's just all over the place. And she was like, that's okay. You about to put it in the fire, you know. But it, it's a trip. So, um Oh, anyway, yes, free flow writing, quiet time. I think I am a little yes. afraid of my thoughts. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why so many of us will pack our schedules, right? Even in a pandemic, you know, we are going from Zoom to Zoom to Zoom because we are, we just do not want to be quiet. And so sometimes it's it's a real fear of what's going to come up. What am I going to learn about myself? Or what, I, what have I been pushing down so hard that I just don't even want it to bubble up if I give myself some quiet? So Dr. Joy, I want to transition a little bit and talk about self-care. A question that was coming up, you know, almost in, in almost every college speech um, was, what do you do for self-care? And I'm sure it's because of, you know, how they see me like, oh, you're busy a lot. You, you know, you have to take care of yourself. 
But I wonder if we really understand what um, self-care practices look like and what they are. Can you talk a little bit about what is self-care? So the next time we ask this question or we think about it ourselves, we're a little more informed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think self-care has been kind of um, commodified into like a special lotion and a special candle that you need to take care of yourself when really self-care is all of the things that we need to do to sustain ourselves so that we can keep going. And so sometimes maybe it looks like a bubble bath, but other times it looks like saying no so that you can get some rest. Sometimes it looks like um, putting some distance between you and the friend who you're always arguing with, right? So it isn't just, you know, like these fancy things and they don't, it doesn't have to call, cost money, um, but it is anything that we need to do to take care of ourselves. So are we getting enough sleep? Are we getting physical activity? Are we paying attention to what we're eating? Are we staying connected to our support system? Are we engaged with any kinds of spiritual practices that are important to us? All of those things are self-care. So um, I feel like I do all right in this area. I'm definitely a bubble bath person, definitely a hot tub person. I just started working out recently three times a week and I feel so much better physically. But the place where I was kind of falling short was on that like devotional, spiritual practice, like a regular time. And so my best friend and I were like, here's the challenge. We both are having a hard time doing this if we're not doing it together. So we literally have the phone just sitting there we read the mm -hmm. shared devotional and sit there and, and we're writing or we, we pray together. And that is working um, a lot better. Is, are there other things that you think we could be incorporating in addition to sleep? There's some challenge that we were going to look at um, on Instagram where it's like drink two liters of water, eight hours of sleep, which is so hard, especially with this <laughs> new 6 a.m. workout. Um, what are the other things that we can do? And, and give me two or three things you do for self-care. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I also think making sure that we are creating joy in our schedules, right? So again, where are you really refilling your cup? You know, so what kinds of things make you laugh until you cry? Who are the people who bring that out of you? What kinds of books or shows do you watch that really make you feel joyful? Like that is also a really, really important part of self-care is making sure that you are staying engaged with joy and laughter and play. Um, you know, we sometimes lose that after we are grown up, but it's still important even for adults to stay engaged in the sense of play. So that's something else I would encourage you to add to your self-care regimen um, in terms of what I do for self-care. So I am a huge napper. Um, so I take naps whenever I feel like, okay, I've kind of hit a wall for the day. I need to go and lay it down. Um, I also like to get outside with my kids as often as possible. So we are here in Georgia. The weather has been relatively nice. Um, so we have been able to kind of go in the driveway and like ride bikes or jump rope or do those kinds of things. And being outside can really be helpful because it helps you to stay connected to like the fact that the world is still turning, even though you may still kind of be in your house. Have you had any challenges, um, mental health challenges of your own during COVID where you were like, okay, I got to come to, I, I got to believe that there's some amount of pressure you experience with your name, literally mean, <laughs> being joy to always being like, okay, people expect me to be joyful 24, seven, 365. The devil is a lie. I'm going to have a day too. Like, <laughs> What does that look like for you? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, on the days where I do not have to be on, right? So if I'm not doing an interview or not doing any kind of speaking, you know, like I am off camera and like in my bonnet and like not being required to give anything to the world. Um, so that definitely has been the case for me. And, you know, like I definitely have struggled with anxiety also like throughout the pandemic, um, you know, both for myself and my family. And I have two small kids, right? And so it, it still feels like there's still unknown related to like children in COVID and so that makes me incredibly anxious about what the fall looks like like they've been home this entire year um, with virtual schooling and so I'm still worrying now about like what August looks like um, about you know making decisions about whether they go back to school or not and Dr. Joy when that anxiety hits do you immediately recognize it and then start to engage in some practice or sometimes is it like the next day like ooh, i was really anxious what does that <laughs> practice look like for you 
Yeah, I think both. Um, but you know, I also have a regular therapy appointment on Tuesdays at two o'clock, um, which really helps me to kind of stay grounded. And so I can talk with her about, um, you know, like I felt uh, an increase in anxiety this week around whatever. So she really helps me to kind of keep things in perspective. Um, and sometimes I'm able to like talk myself out of it, right? So I can recognize like, okay, this is just a high anxiety moment. Um, let's just take some deep breaths and, you know, kind of get through this. Um, but other times I like kind of journal around it and then bring it back to my therapy the next week I love that I'm like I'm getting all the gems right now I feel so I feel so special um and speaking of special one of the things that um I've seen often in the black community um growing up and I would say less so now but I still think there's some of that out there um around again around the stigma around um our mental health is we'll say somebody is special or, you know, they always been a little different or mm -hmm. um, so-and-so is crazy or so-and-so is out their mind or they're nuts. What do you say to people about the terminology we use when somebody is um, has like a diagnosed uh, mental disorder or they're just experiencing depression or they're experiencing um, behavior that feels kind of manic or erratic? Maybe it's from a lack of sleep. Maybe it's because they're grieving Whatever it is, what are some of the things that we can do to be more conscious with our words um, mm -hmm. and making sure that we're not demonizing or stigmatizing someone that does need help? Yeah, this is such an important question um, because that kind of language definitely does further stigmatize language. You know, it makes it more difficult for people to share when they're having concerns because they're afraid of what people are going to say. Um, so I would definitely encourage you to be very mindful of, you know, kind of throwing around labels and, you know, this is so crazy and like all of that kind of language I think is important to kind of stay away from um, and using people first language. I'd also wonder why are you feeling the need to talk about a diagnosis anyway, right? You know, if you are not a trained mental health professional engaging in a professional relationship with someone, is there really a need for you to be talking about anybody's diagnosis anyway? And I think sometimes this comes up maybe when we are offering to try to get somebody help, but I would encourage people not to get so focused on like, oh, what might the diagnosis be, but instead refer to the symptoms that you're having. So let's say you have a friend who you realize, you know, is kind of staying up for days on end or, um, you know, they're not like as excited about certain things like they used to be, then you, I would encourage you to talk with them about the symptoms. Like, hey, I've noticed that it doesn't seem like you've slept in the last three days or it feels like you don't come to Bible study anymore. I'm, I'm just wanting to check in. Is there anything I can help you with? Right. So focusing on the behavior that you are um, observing as opposed to any kind of diagnosis that you think might fit is a far better way to enter that conversation. And speaking of Bible study, we got to go to church. So <laughs> Dr. Joy. <laughs> One of the things that I saw, you know, really growing up in church, um, really high school, I started going to Kojic Church. And I feel like now looking back, there were some moments where demons were being cast out where it might have been a mental health situation, you know, mm -hmm. not that it can be both, not that the demon right. can be, you know, disturbing mental health. I'm not, you know, doubt God. I'm just saying, do you think that there are, are places where, um, the church needs to make it okay a little more, make it a little more okay to go see a therapist. Like, yes, we can have faith in God, but the Bible does say faith without works is dead. You know, <laughs> what about that? Yeah, and, and I am very pleased, though I think that there is more work to be done in this area, but I am very pleased by how many congregations I am now seeing um, talking about mental health in the pulpit, right? Talking with their congregations about the fact that you can see a therapist and still be strong in your faith um, community as well, because I think historically it has felt as if there was an exclusion, right? Like either you pray or you go to a therapist, when the truth is that you can do both of those things. And, you know, a lot of therapists, um, practice what we call faith sensitivity or faith inclusive, which not which doesn't mean we're going to like pull the Bible out when you come to your therapy session, but we will try to incorporate spirituality that's important to you into the work that you may be doing in therapy. Um, you know, so I think it is really important to focus on the fact that you don't have to choose one or the other. You can engage in both of those practices in the interest of your mental health. You know, spirituality is really important. That is seen as a protective factor for a lot of people in terms of mental health. So if that is something that that is important to you, it's important for you to know that you can find a therapist who will also respect that. 
I love that. And they definitely will find that if they just go to your Instagram and listen to your podcast <laughs> as a resource. You got all the resources. And even with that, we know that there's not enough um, black psychotherapists in the field. What are you doing to ensure that those barriers that exist that you frankly have overcome um, continue to be dismantled so you can make um, mental health care professionals more accessible to our community? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I am really excited about how large our therapist directory is. So we have over 3000 therapists listed there. Um, So it is definitely a great place to start. But you're right, like even 3000 is not enough for all of the people who want to see a black therapist. And so I think it is important to be talking to students about looking at a mental health field as a possible career. Um, You know, I think sometimes people get really turned away because you have to go to school for some time um, to be a practicing mental health professional. But there are ways that you know we can make that more attractive to students and I think that there are ways that schools can be doing a better job of making sure that people have healthy experiences in the training programs because I think that that is also a deterrence is that a lot of people you know grad school is stressful enough but when you are talking about the racism and the sexism and the other things that also happen in grad school it is something else that keeps people away from the field. Wow yeah but you're gonna you're gonna experience it everywhere I didn't go to um, the same kind of grad school you did. I went to law school and I saw Mm -hmm. that in law school, in undergrad, in um, high school, you know. So it definitely comes up everywhere. I'm um, I'm curious to know, as we talk about um, not just mental disorder, mental illnesses or mental challenges that we all, you know, could experience or if somebody in our family could experience. Also also addiction though. Um, And normally when we talk about addiction, People think drugs or alcohol, but what about this new thing, Dr. Joy, this new thing? How do you, what do you think about um, device addiction and like starting at a young age, like with kids? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think anything can become too much if we over rely on it. Right. And so I think it's always really important to ask ourselves questions around why I'm engaging in a certain behavior. You know, so is it something that we are using to avoid something else? Are we doing it because we feel anxious and this helps us to kind of give anxiety a place to go? So I think you always have to be asking yourself those questions around why am I using this? And especially, you know, when we talk about like Instagram and stuff like you have to know that there are people on staff at places on our favorite social media apps that their entire job is to figure out how to keep us on there as long as possible, right? They're using the same psychology that people use in casinos to make sure that we don't have the cues to know it may be time to put this down. And so you have to kind of be very intentional if you know that you're somebody who can fall into the tendency of just like losing hours at a time. You have to be very intentional about, okay, I'm going to sit here. I'm going to only do this for an hour that's why you know some of the apps that cut off the (laughs) cut off the uh, app can be sometimes or like the timers that you can set on your phone to let you know okay you've done enough of that it's time to move on to something else that is so good what's so what's so crazy is um i was telling my best friend this week that i feel like i have like a you know like the inspirational quotes like posting Mm -hmm. that i feel like that's an addiction Mm. (laughs) Because, and you know, like, it'll be like, this is so good. Oh, my God, I want to share it. And then somebody Mm -hmm. was in my DM like, oh, my God, I really needed this today. So I'm like, oh, somebody going to need this one, too. Oh, I really Uh like that. And so Mm -hmm. you read it, but you didn't even really have the opportunity to process it. Mm -hmm. You know, like, Mm -hmm. I'm in performance around wellness and mental health and on inspiring. And if I really haven't taken the time to pour back into my cup, what am I really doing? That's kind of performative, you know? Yeah, so I was like, and you know, what you're talking about is the same way slot machines work, right? Like, so you put in a thousand quarters and then you finally get a payoff. So you share all of these quotes and somebody sends you a DM, right? So you are getting reaffirmed in the same ways that we do when we play a slot machine. And so you get this DM every now and then it encourages you to keep on going. So you do sometimes get mindless about it, even though it can come from a good place. You just don't recognize like how much time or energy sometimes it is taking you away from doing maybe other things girl this i needed this today okay here's my this is this is one of my last questions i might not be because you keep coming up with good things and then i'm like oh that reminds me of this over here covid and couples Mm. 
or COVID and no more couple. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Like people have experienced a number of mm -hmm. challenges in relationship because of things that the pandemic brought up for folks in terms of trauma and, you know, in terms of them being their worst selves or, you know, somebody else making it feel like that person's not their best self. What mm -hmm. advice do you have for people who decided, OK, I'm going to stick with you, but I'm, I'm hanging on by like this much. What do you say to couples who are still struggling through the pandemic and trying to hold on to the love they once shared? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that this has been a transition just like any other transition, right? And so transitions can be difficult for us even when they are pleasant experiences. And so when we think about the pandemic, which has largely not been a pleasant experience, of course, there will be some strain likely in relationships because it has been very, very difficult. And so if you have the resources and the interest in talking with a couples therapist, that can be really helpful. Um, but even individual therapy to kind of help you understand like what was underneath that you know because you brought all of who you were to the pandemic in the first place and so it may have kind of kicked some things up um you know maybe you are displacing any anxiety you feel about what's happening in the world onto your partner and so maybe a therapist would be able to help you unpack some of those things but i think we have to think about the fact that this has been a very difficult transition and transitions can be difficult on all of our kind of family institutions and so it, it, it is to be expected that there will be some readjustment and okay how do we kind of move through this in a way that feels healthy for everyone that's so good i am um, i'm so grateful for you taking the time i'm so grateful for therapy for black girls and the inspirational quotes that maybe i'll you know <laughs> post a few a little a little less um but I, I i also am grateful for um who you are dr joy the fact that you bring joy to the world through healing um, in a real way. And you're so committed to doing that for black women and black girls and, um, our people. And it just is so meaningful because I know that we are so much better because you're here, um, serving and also getting that self care on with that bonnet when you don't have to be. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, but no, but I really do thank you. And I hope you know how important you are to all of us, to the culture. And, um, I hope you know that if there's ever anything I can do to support you, um, to encourage you, to love on you and, um, to make your path a little easier. If I can, I'm here. Thank you. I really appreciate that, Angela. Ah, well, thank you for taking the time, Dr. Joy. Absolutely. It's a pleasure.